You know, I, I am having a concern. Uh, when, when I was uh, new in writing, I wrote a book which is a very important book, Out of the Labyrinth. I think many of you have read it, and uh, it's a good book. I tried to get publishers interested, none of them were interested. So I said, all right, I'll start my own publishing company. And since then, I've written 144 books. I have written, I've had three million, over three million <coughs> sold in America, and that doesn't count India or the 32 languages I've translated it, that my books have been into, that have been translated, I should say. And uh, I'm having the same thing with movies now. Everybody seems to think they know what a movie should be, and they want to change it so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether I shouldn't just form my own movie company. <laughs> 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 I mean, they, they go the safe way. This is what earns money, okay, this is what we'll do. Uh -huh. But the only time books of mine have been published by big publishing houses, they failed. They made a mess of them. When we do it, and we send our, out to our distributors and so on, we do it beautifully. Mm -hmm. But for instance, I wrote the secrets books to be little things to earn money for the, for the um, publishing company. That was the entire motive. It, it was purely mercenary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, they put it all into one book that that wouldn't work, and it didn't work. And I think the other book was uh, um, some other book. Awakened Superconscious? I think that was it, yeah. But uh, that didn't, they didn't do well with that either. We do splendidly. So why not start our own movie company? <laughs> well, you, you, have, you have several movie producers being trained right now. Yeah, and she might do it. it. <laughs> yeah. Now, if they start telling me what to do, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. It would be nice to be in a different format, because actually it seems like a lot of times they say, this movie sells, and, and they have a certain format. I know. And then they put it well, none of my books are orthodox, but people like them. I, I, hello, Roby. Hello, so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Como esta? Bien. Bien. So, um, anyway, anybody here want to help me out? <laughs> <laughs> I'm approaching the end of this, this uh, um, round. I hope it'll be the last round. And here I'm 86, and if people are trying to tell me how to do things, um, I'm just about ready to kick in. <laughs> Say goodbye, world. <laughs> goodbye, cruel world. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Have you been enjoying your crew, your tour? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, how much should we involve ourselves like with followers of other paths? I used to um, be with the Vinod Society and other groups and I'm wondering if we should work with them. Would you help more, me? Or should she says, how much should we be involved with other groups? She used to be involved with another group and how, how much should she continue that involvement? Like like, should we work with them, not like join the other group, but work Well, I with think them. once you follow a path, it's better to stay with that path. It's not that all other paths are false, but they do have differences. And people who go with several paths may find their feet in two boats and fall in the middle. And so, um, I, I have read well-known teachers, good teachers, who teach different things from what my guru taught. And if I were at all like many people, I would say, now, who's right? I've made up my mind who's right. Quite a few of the saints I went to in India tried to get me as their disciple. I just wouldn't, it wasn't interesting. But uh, I would say for that reason, better stay loyal. If you like this path, I don't say you have to follow this path. I, I don't, uh, I, uh, I, when I give lectures. She means as an She means, she means the organization of Ananda working with other groups. What other groups? Yeah, with like other... The Ananda Society. I'm all for it. Yeah, collaborating. But I'm all for it. 
the trouble is they aren't. But really, I'd be happy to work with any group. They, they usually don't like it, but uh, we're, we're open that way. I always tell people, I'm not trying to convert you to anything except your own higher self. And I'm not, I, I don't like this competitiveness. Everybody is teachers the best. And uh, in, no matter how many you go to, they're all their teachers are the best. I never say Yogananda is the best. He's right for me. He may not be right for everybody, maybe uh, not the best one. I don't care. He's mine. <laughs> that's what matters to me. I happen to know that he is the best, but that's the <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been devoting all my life to making people understand that. But I don't, I don't like to make it competitive. So any other questions? Doesn't he look like Vijay? Yes, he does. Yeah. <laughs> you look like Vijay. You don't know Vijay. Okay. Oh, I never saw that before. Yeah. 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 Is that the same Vijay that wrote a book about? Yeah. Oh, I've seen him, but I've never met him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? What, what would you suggest to deepen our meditations? Love God more. That's the most important thing. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Love God. Yeah. Swamiji, uh, could you share a little bit about your experience when you took seclusion in the cave in Rishikesh? I went to, uh, into seclusion at Lohagat. It was in the foothills of the Himalayas. We saw what? We went we there. Went there. Did you to Lohagat? Yeah, I have a yeah. picture of it. You mean below Vashish to Gupa? Oh, On yeah. the beach. Huh? On the beach below Vashish to Gupa? No, that's not it. Oh, that's where No. Oh. Lohagat is near Mayavati, which Ramakrishna started a monastery there. And it's pretty hard to get to. I was surprised that you would say that. Um, you go by train from Bareilly to Tanakpur. Then you get in a very slow train. I don't know what it's like now, but when I went there, a little girl about five was walking in the same direction and passing us. <laughs> and when, you get, when you get to Tanakpur, when you get to Tanakpur, then you take a bus. And it goes for quite a long time over winding territory. I saw this driver looking like this, and he was just inches from the steep precipice. I said, look where you're driving. <laughs> yes, beautiful view, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm still here. <laughs> but, uh, and then it was a very small village. They had only one street. I'll call it Main Street, but whatever it was. And there was a, an English family that had uh, an estate, Fern Hill Estate. And they wanted to sell it, and I was eager to buy it. But again, as Eric was down on everything I did, but uh, I, I had a little house there, and I didn't speak to anybody. It was very, very, very nice. Did you, uh, did you also... It's in the Komaon oh. Hills, where Jim Corbett wrote that book, you know, mm -hmm. Managers of the Komaon. But there are no managers there now. Anyway, I didn't see any on my long walk. <laughs> we were told you were at that one... Well, did you also seclude by Fashista Gua? Uh, yes. In that little cave? Yes, I for did. For a month? That was hardly seclusion because I had to work on editing a magazine. <laughs> so I, I can't really call it seclusion. The other one is a real seclusion. But uh, it sounds good. <laughs> I had a, a yeah, lots of little muskrats or whatever oh. kept coming in. And somebody from Kerala became my devotee, you might say, and he used to meditate there uh, after I left. And he heard a noise at the back of the cave and opened his eyes, there was this cobra. And he oh, ran for his life. So I suppose I lived with that cobra for <laughs> for four weeks. <laughs> but I would have loved for it to be a true seclusion. I, I just had to get the magazine out. I had no choice. Did someone bring you food there, though? 
Did someone bring you food there? I brought a lot of food in a trunk, and that's what I used. Yeah. So, Amici, someone um, sent me an article that um, they call that cave the Jesus Cave. Not the Shushta Gufa, but that, that one, because a number of people were med have meditated in it and had visions of Jesus. Mm. Did you ever hear that? No, that nor did I. <laughs> <laughs> You still have a reputation as um, uh, when we were there last year. Um, walk, oh, the, the American Swami who walked along the beach with his typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the number one quality that we need to cultivate to get closer to God? The most important quality is devotion. Yeah. So Yukteswar in his book, The Holy Science said that until you can love, develop the natural love of the heart, you can't take one step toward him. So of all the qualities, you know, I was very intellectual when I came to Master, and he kept telling me, get devotion. But I was working hard and chanting hours a day and so on, and I did develop it, but he started telling me to do intellectual work. And I felt rather upset with him. But I realized in time that you, you don't have to become stupid to love God. So he wasn't trying to d diminish my intellect. He was trying to balance it. But devotion is the most important. There has to be, it's like, otherwise like living next door to a world famous restaurant. You know their menu, you know everything about it, but you're not hungry. So you never go in. So you have to have that hunger. Any other? On the threat of seclusion, at Ananda village, it's very active. What degree do you recommend we seclude? Because it doesn't seem like I could even take like a day of silence without being. What is he saying? He's saying. Uh, Sorry, I'm deaf as opposed. <laughs> What do you re recommend for seclusion at Ananda village? It's so busy that he can hardly get a day of silence. I think it's very important. I used to go out to the desert and not speak a word. And uh, I remember Mokshanand and I were out together. The only words we exchanged were, I wrote a note saying, What's this? And he wrote spinach. <laughs> 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 Something like in a pen there. But uh, it's very good to have a week or two of seclusion every year. And uh, I would like to start emphasizing that more. And I mean by seclusion, not speak to anybody. Just completely be silent. Write notes if you have to, but it's a very good thing. So please, all of you, take that. If you take one thing from India, take the one thing it doesn't give you, silence. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Swamiji, you wrote this um, beautiful Visits to Saints of India book, yes. which um, we didn't come across to almost the end, and so it's, it's fascinating and it's wonderful. Um, I'm thinking the highlight of this trip for probably most of us is seeing you. Um, second to that, are there any uh, living saints that you... You know, when I came back, I first came to India in 1958. And uh, at that time I met quite a few saints. I have to say that the last two or three years that I've been here, I haven't met any. No. no. You'd think I'd attract them, but I, I don't know. I know that India has to go through this period. It doesn't worry me. Abdul Kalam, K K um, Mr. Katikan took me to meet him. And Abdul Kalam said, Do you, what did you feel? You were here in the late 50s. Has India changed much? I said, it's changed extraordinarily. But it needs to go through this. It needs to claim its place among the great nations of the world. And it'll go back to its... Even now, I find that the, the devotion is increasing again. Uh, ten years ago, there was no devotion, all money. Too bad. But now it's changing. 
and more people start coming. But uh, when I was here before, there were so many wonderful saints I met. Yeah, yeah. When Swamiji, um, many people are taking spiritual names or have taken spiritual names. What is the importance of choosing? No, it's no importance particularly, except <laughs> as a reminder. It reminds you that, uh, but really, once you get used to being called that, you don't really often think of yourself as meaning that. A person may take the name Bhakti, and uh, after a year or two, she's never even thinking that. So it has minimal value. So it has some. I'm trying to defend myself. Because <laughs> everybody and his brother has been asking for names. And I don't know Sanskrit. <laughs> I know some, but not much. Were you asking one? No, I was just going to mention that we were at Shivananda's ashram yes. and there was a, a Swami there who was with Shivananda and he said he met you in 1958. What's his name? Um, Vimalananda. He, yeah, he was originally from Canada actually and then okay. he's, he's still there and he's president I guess. Yeah. But I met Shivananda, there was another one. Yeah. 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 It was an odd thing though because he um, let anybody do anything. Somebody could make the noise of a tabla with his mouth. And he had him perform. It was really a tamasha. But I, I think he was a great saint. Any other questions? Yeah. What suggestions do you have for pilgrims who struggle with meditation? You, everybody struggles with meditation. You know, it's, here we're going this way, it's going this way. I said to somebody who came to me the other day, and he said, as you first said, you have to understand I've got my mind full of projects. And I said, look, make your meditation those projects. Forget about meditation. I said, uh, um, think of God, bring God into your workplace. Try to make it an active meditation that way. But he's not ready to meditate. So uh, if you feel the desire to meditate, then do. But otherwise, I say, bargaining with people, okay, meditate as long as you brush your teeth in the evening. Do that much meditation, <laughs> and maybe five minutes of meditation, but you'll get to have a taste for it, and then you'll get to liking it more and more and more. And uh, in that way, it, it will grow on you. So there's hope. There's absolutely no. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody would ever get out of this mess. And you have the eyes of somebody who would like to meditate, so do work at it. And that's the biggest reason for community, is helping people. You know, I'm trying my that. best to make Indians realize the importance of communities. America is really, I read something the other day that the government has decided to print $500 billion a month. Wow. You know, that's, when they release that into the marketplace, it's going to create the dollar to just go down like that. Master said that the dollar won't be worth the, mo the paper it's printed on. But that's a heavy prediction. And we, we have to understand that the world is going into a very bad place. Economically, that will bring wars. Um, I don't see any way we can get out of it. But one thing is a very interesting point that I read about, that two religious communities in the center of Nagasaki and Yokohama, um, where they, Hiroshima, where they dropped the atom bomb, Two religious communities near the epicenter were not touched. They just were living for God. So Master said, the most important thing is to love God, and He will protect you. And I've seen that in my own life again and again. There's that marvelous story of when I, I 
Well, what happened was first was, I was in the, I had double pneumonia in uh, India, and a doctor came in. I was practically unconscious, and the doctor came in. You know, a doctor who's coming to see a patient who's practically unconscious usually says, how may I help you? He came in, his first question was, how can you help me? <laughs> and he said, I have a son in college in Canada, and I have this that an obligation and that obligation. How is it possible to be successful in this world and be completely dharmic? And I said that without dharma you won't succeed. Yet the dharma the more the, the more dharmic you are, the more successful you will be. Well, I was not a good advertisement for success at that moment. <laughs> and he left looking very skeptical. So I, the next day I decided to write a course on success through Dharma. And uh, I wrote it, I forget how long it is, 32? 32 pages? 32 lessons? 32 lessons. I think so. Anyway, um, that took me a year and a half to write. And after I had finished, I went to Carmel to celebrate with Divine Mother. After, after finishing a big job, I always like to celebrate with her. And I forgot that it was August, and this was the top tourist season, and I couldn't find any place to stay. There was one room I found, but it was much too expensive for me. I, I, if I paid that, I wouldn't have the money to go home. So um, he said, well, uh, that's all right. Uh, come anyway. I said, well, no, I, I don't think I should, meaning I didn't know I could get home if I paid it. He said, no, I don't want you to pay at all. I said, why not? He said, I'll just write you down as a travel agent. Why? I don't know, I just like you. <laughs> and so, and that was my major expense for that time in Carmel. And then I went to a restaurant and the owner sat down with me and chatted for a while and he wouldn't let me pay for my meal. So when you do things with God, he takes care of you. And this is, I've seen this again and again. There was a marvelous time. I felt Divine Mother wanted me go, to go back to India. I hadn't been there, been here now, in uh, 10 years. And uh, I had the money to go and stay for two months and come back. But I went into San Francisco and my car threw a rod. And I realized I had to get rid of this car and get another car. And I thought, well, Divine Mother, what can I do? I know I have to come back from India. I know I'll need a car when I come back. Should I just have faith that you'll take care of it? It doesn't make sense to me. And so I finally I ended up getting uh, with this car turned in and uh, another thousand dollars. I had a good used car about $1,800. And I finally decided, okay, I'll do it. So I put the money down on this, uh, to spend this money for the new car. And that was Friday evening. The next Monday morning, I got a letter in the mail. To me personally, it was, we had a check enclosed for $1,000. It was somebody I didn't know. And he wrote, do, use this as Divine Mother wants you to. How many people in America think of God as Divine Mother? I hadn't met him, and yet, and I've seen wonderful things like this happen. So don't, don't doubt. God will take care of you if you love him. But we're coming to a time of very great depression. And when I think of India, Pakistan would love to invade India. It's much too small. But Pakistan's backed by China. And so, this could easily be India. Well, we're, we've moved away from Delhi, which is, of course, the capital. That's a worrisome place. This happens to be the defense capital of India, Pune. Anyway, the thing is, the world is really, is in the next few years, we're going to see hard times. And it'll be much worse than 1930s. People won't have the money to eat. When in Detroit even, four years ago was it, 
when they had that depression there. And uh, they, to bring food into the inner cities, two men had to ride gun, shotgun or whatever on the sides just to protect that truck. It, in a real depression, that's going to be much worse. People won't let the food go into the inner cities. And, and, and. Don't, and warfare is very likely. I don't think that we've seen the end of the atom bombs. Everybody says no, but when you want to win a war, you use the best means available. Master said no corner of this planet will be safe. There was somebody at the end of World War I who said that he could see that another world war would come. He didn't want to be a part of it. So he searched the whole globe. And finally, in 1938, he bought land on the island of Guam. <laughs> that was the center of the World War II in the Pacific. <laughs> you can't get away, but you can get away too. You can be in God and he will protect you. And you know when you die, it's no big thing. It's not so nice that we're dying, but getting out of it, it feels good after that. So was, did, was, um, did um, Yogananda sit, speak this way? He did. Before he died? I mean, was yes, he did, he did. In the late 40s and early 50s? And he said one time in church in Hollywood, and I was present, he said, you don't know what a terrible cataclysm is coming. Cataclysm is not even man-made. You wonder what it meant. Does it mean, who knows? But uh, no, we're not coming to pleasant times. And he talked about it quite frequently. So I read your economy in the, in the solution. Yes. And yeah. I, I really enjoyed that book that you just read. Yes. And, um, well, it makes sense. <coughs> but I do plead with all of you uh, here in India, get behind this community here. Master said someday this idea, idea would spread like wildfire. People all over the world will feel the, feel the need for it. But right now getting it started has been difficult. People think, sure, sure, not today, maybe tomorrow, maybe after I'm gone. And so they're waiting a little bit. I think at least to have one community in India to offer an example to others. When others people, other people see it really happening, they will go that direction. Not many people, but some people. You know, you can't expect most people to change. And I will add to that, you can't expose, expect most people to survive. It'll be the new generation, mostly, who take this up. But why be stupid? Why not do it now? I really think that to be a part of this Pune community is extremely important. And in America, to, you know, when I, when I started the first Ananda community in America, the one Ananda village in near Nirdivada city, I had a lot of trouble. Everybody wanted to do it his way, his way, his way. I could hardly open my mouth and 10 people would leap into it. <laughs> but now that we finally got it settled, so that it's, it's going in a particular way, now we can say to people, this is how we do it. And they can take it or leave it. They can't come in and start, I know there was one fellow there, I, he, after six months, he started saying that, well, in Japan they have the system that when the old people get, get old, the new people should come in. He was trying to take over Ananda. Was I old then? I was 41. <laughs> I had to say to him, I did not start Ananda to turn it over to you. And I had to be fierce sometimes. But now it's going beautiful. If we start communities, if other people start communities, it would be very helpful to say we're following the Ananda system. It doesn't have to be our, our own work even. But if, they, if we have a system that works and they follow that system, it'll be much, much easier. The hard part was the first part. And we, we bled through those years. Now we don't have to worry. Just tell them you're doing, the, you're doing it according to the Anonza system. So advertise the idea of people coming there and learning what that system is. And our two basic principles, um, people are more important than things. And yata dharma, sata jaya. Where there is dharma, there is victory. 
I have been rigid in following that. There was a time in the beginning when I, um, I was ma making all the money to start Ananda, and it took a lot of work. I had to teach classes in yoga from city to city, every night a different city. I remember one night I came, came home to my parents' house in Atherton before going to give a class, and she looked at me, my mother looked at me, she said, you just can't punish yourself like this. You've got to, you've got to cancel this class. I said, I can't, I don't know where they live, how can I cancel it? So I went into my bedroom and closed my eyes and thought of all the things that were making me so exhausted. Constant telephone calls and I, this wave of energy would go out to push it out of my life and I said, well, I can't help it, it's a part of my life, so let it be. And I accepted it and all the telephone calls and all the classes and going here and going there, all the letters I had to write, I had to do it all myself. I had nobody to help me. And every time it, I thought of it, I instead of pushing it away, I said, okay, let it be. And I came out of that, uh, that half hour and Mother said, oh, you've had such a good sleep, I can see it. <laughs> and I hadn't slept at all. And I gave maybe the best class I've ever given on the energization <laughs> exercise. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, this is how hard I was working. When somebody came to me and said, I've inherited a certain amount of money, and what would you advise? Would you like would you advise me to join Ananda? In which case, I'd give this money to Ananda. Or do you think I should go to India? So I thought, well, he's giving me a choice. That means he isn't serious about joining Ananda. So I asked him how much money he had. I said 200,000, he said $200,000. And that was like a million dollars today. And uh, I, I didn't hesitate, I wasn't even tempted. I said, you should go to India. I've never heard from him again. But I've been very rigidly dharmic and yet we've somehow thrived. When we had that forest fire, it destroyed 450 of our 700 acres, 21 of our 22 homes, and uh, then our neighbors discovered that it was a faulty count for spark arrest on a county vehicle that had caused the fire, and our neighbors all sued and collected their money. I said, I will not sue. And we had no means of making money, we had, really we were in desperate situation, but we, those people who decided they wanted to leave, leave, we gave them the money that came in in donations. We gave it first to them. And anyway, here we still are. So I have, I do believe absolutely that when you follow the path of righteousness, then you will survive. You will, God will protect you. And I, my feeling, I had to reach the point where I thought, God, if you don't want to protect me, that's your business. I can, I can, you can take everything, fine. And then when I had those lawsuits, I had the same thought. If you want to destroy me, fine. But we're still thriving and they're not. So, these are the two main principles on which a community should, should be built. And uh, then, of course, there should be love. And people are more important than things. I've met many Swamis in India, Chinmayananda being one example, who cut corners ethically to get what they wanted. But they got what they wanted, but they didn't get. It, it wasn't a good thing. I want this community to be dharmic, and I, I believe it will be. But after I'm gone, which I hope will be very soon, like next week, <laughs> 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 then I want you all to be firm in this thought. Any other questions? From other learnings you got from Yogananda, which is like uh, the most important one that you feel in your heart? What's he saying? What is the most important lesson that Swami got from building Ananda? No, from, from yoga. yoga. From yoga. What's the most important lesson you got from Master? I think my whole life is that. I could say devotion, but it's been many things. He spent many hours talking to me. I, I think he, he knew that I would be carrying on his message. Because he, he said to me many times, you have a great work to do. One time he said, 
of the men, on, the only one who hasn't disappointed me is St. Lynn. And he said, you mustn't disappoint me. And he said, with great power. But I know that there were men who didn't disappoint him spiritually. It's that men have this outgoing energy. Women are more indrawn. And uh, this outward energy was needed to get his work spreading, and I have that. And so he was very anxious to have me do that. So I think that he spent, that's how I could write that demystifying Patanjali, because he talked to me so many hours about those things. I was out of the desert with him, and he spent hours just talking to me. Did you feel like he was also revealing at this time when you were writing it too? Or were you recalling from the times that he had? I was deliberately remembering what he said. Mm -hmm. The demystifying Patanjali? Yeah. It was all from what he told me. It, yeah. When he was still in body? Yeah. So nothing felt like it was coming Also, also. But things he specifically said. Oh, yeah. so it was the combination. Yeah. Swamiji, what's your reaction uh, or thoughts regarding the John Parson book that just released? I think it's a great book. Have you all read it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good book. It's absolutely the truth. We had to go through all of that. One time, to give you a thought, because I know that many people don't think this way, but I have to say it's true. When we were in Pasadena, and Diamato was very anxious for us not to um, depose her. And uh, she was so charming. We all just, she said, no more lawsuits. And she said it with real charm and conviction. And we finally said, okay, we won't take that deposition. On her way home, Heidi Hall was one of the directors. She left us, mainly because of the way they treated me. But uh, she said, she said to the people in the car, that's the last time I'll ever see him again. Yeah. It I like call that hypocrisy. It sounds like a, um, a, a, a big lesson, too, is you know, do things dharmically and then have perseverance. Yeah, because perseverance. <laughs> <is good. laughs> you know, in the European, in the Western system of a, hor of a horoscope, I have all the big planets and a big grand cross in fixed signs. And you can't get a worse combination than that. <laughs> There's a German astrologer who says, I don't know how he can live with that horoscope. But uh, really, it's been a very good life. I haven't worried about it at all. <laughs> oh, yeah, a few physical problems, and getting thrown out by my Gora's organization, and yes. nonetheless. When I, yeah? Astrology. Um, we were just talking about astrology and, and whether it's Western or Vedic. The Vedic um, is different. What, what is the best way to be victorious, even though your astrology chart may say certain things will keep you back? What you think? What's the best way to be victorious, even though your, your chart says one thing? Master said, don't worry about your karma. Just do your best, no matter what. I've had little problems in my life. I had uh, my hips reached the point where you could see me in a crowd. <laughs> I wore away two inches of hip bone just with the pain. Sometimes people would say to me while we were walking, they'd ask me a question, they'd say, are you listening? I said, you have to realize it's taking every ounce of my willpower just to keep walking. And when I finally went to a doctor to have, it, have my hip fixed, he said, you should have been bedridden years ago. But I continued, and uh, I had that little problem. And he said the worst case he'd ever seen was when I hip. And uh, I've had open heart surgery and cancer of the colon. They took out this much of the colon and lots of little problems materially. <coughs> and uh, then I got thrown out by <coughs> SRF and um, left in New York with nothing, but God took care of that. My parents arrived from New York, from Europe in New York just the day that I was thrown out. So I was able to contact them and came back to California. 
and uh, lawsuits. Hmm? Yeah, lots of lawsuits. Yeah, <laughs> they they couldn't destroy me by kicking me out, so they sued me. I think they spent fifty million dollars on those lawsuits, but we're still there, and not kicking. <laughs> Everything's been beautiful. Like I hope I didn't defend him. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? It sounds like Lot. Lot in the Bible. What? It sounds like Lot in the Bible. Like you were devoted to God, you loved God and Guru, and you were devoted to Master, and uh, and then you came through all these trials, just like you know Lot loved God so much, and then they said, well, "Oh, Job." Oh, you know, sorry, Rogers and Job. <laughs> Rogers and Job. <laughs> yeah, Job. Because then, then. Um, then when, you know, then all the trial, they said, well, you love God because it's so simple for you. Because, you know, you have everything, everything's wonderful. But they gave him all the tests and trials, and he still loved God. It seems like you're the same way with Master. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. The, there's a, um, one of the ancient, like Brigada, what is it, Agastya, in Gurgaon is a branch of that. Anyway, I had a very interesting thing. They came to see me, and uh, the moment they started their reading, this is from 5,000 years ago, and India has really got weird things going on. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in Sabzi Mandi across from Delhi was found while they were digging in the soil, and this yogi sitting cross-legged. They brought him back to consciousness somehow, and he, he was able to speak, but nobody could understand him. And finally they got this pundit who knew ancient Sanskrit, and he came and he said, it's a very old form of Sanskrit. But uh, he, he said, what yoga is this? And they said, Kali Yoga, which they believe in India. He said, well, I'm not interested. In when you come back to your body after leaving it a long time, then you can't, you can't keep it. Divine Mother, probably kept him that way, brought him back that way, because he doesn't want people to find liberation selfishly just for themselves. They have to, they have to. Uh, it, I asked Esther, how many people do you have to save? He said at least six. So there was another <laughs> case in outside Calcutta that my f guru's father knew. And uh, there was some Maharaja, they, they, on, they were digging a lake to get the water out and make land out of it, and they found under the lake about the, the people figured they must have been there at least 300 years, the engineers. And they brought them back from, but the Maharaja used cruel methods to bring them back to consciousness. He used hot pokers, mm -hmm. and they said that you, you, your whole family will suffer for this. And the whole family died. And uh, they said that they had been living there for a long time. They were just almost at reached liberation. Now they have to come back to another body. But Master also said, Divine Mother made that happen so that they would not find God selfishly. You have to help other people. So it was a two-way thing. The Maharaja did wrong in bringing them back that way. But they were wrong in trying to find it just for themselves. So, anyway, what was I saying? Agastya. Agastya reading. Yeah. He just began his reading, and suddenly there was this huge storm. Um, trees were being blown over. Um, huge rain just flooded the streets. Lightning, thunder, everything. And it, as soon as it ended, the moment it ended, the storm ended. And it was at the end of April, so it wasn't monsoon weather. Very strange. Anyway, he said that, what did he say? That you would be doing movies. And he said I'd be doing movies. And I did, but I, I, that's why I began with this discussion. All the movie people wanted to do it their way. I don't know. Swamiji, so how, how would you compare the Briga reading and the Agastya reading? Very different or? similar um, predictions or whatever. I had been through a lot when I came to Agastya. 
the Brigu talked of things that were in the future, and those were not easy things. He said he'd have problems with his everything, and I have had. And he said that there's a danger. He didn't say I would die, but he said there's a danger of sudden death. And one time I was out of the desert, and suddenly a flock of crows flew right around my head. And I thought, this can't be a good omen. <laughs> anyway, I was sleeping out on the, on the terrace. And when I went to make up my bed to go back to Los Angeles two days later, I found a squashed black widow spider between the sheets. I had just turned over and killed it. So that was one near-death thing. Another one was I was setting up a microphone in um, Kapuri for Diamata. And uh, suddenly there was a short circuit. It lifted me off the ground. And uh, it could have killed me. The current here is 230 volts. And uh, um, just in that moment, the fuse blew. I couldn't have let go because when something grabs you like that, the, the power, you clench your hands. But I was saved. I was, my heart was a little upset for a few days, but my life was saved. And a third time, I had bought a lambretta in Italy, and I unfolded it at the Kashmiri Gate in Delhi, took it out of his box. And I didn't know about it, but I sat on the seat and turned the key, not realizing it was in gear. And the moment it was, I turned it on, suddenly it took off. I was surrounded by a brick, high brick walls. And uh, I, I had a, two seconds, probably maximum, to figure out how, how to put it out of gear and stop it. And I stopped just that close to the wall. So three times I could have died, but something saved me. Anyway, that was a very interesting reading. And uh, it said that he will have brothers, but no sister is possible, although one will die in his mother's womb. And uh, so I went, when I came home to America, I asked my mother if she'd ever had a miscarriage. She said, yes, she'd had one. So many things it said that have proved true. Nothing that has not proved true. And it said that I'd have a glorious future and so on. Anyway, the Augusta was many years later. And uh, he said I would be, he cursed me by saying I'd have to live to be 91. And I don't know about this. I'd like to kick off sooner. Only next week then. But my parents and grandparents died at 84. So. <laughs> anyway. Did Master uh, talk about going also for that his work had been finished? <coughs> What did, he, uh, did Master talk about when his work was finished that he was ready to go? Yes. Yes, he said, my work's finished. I will leave. It's time now. So he died very young, but it was his work was finished. My work was to complete his work. And he made that clear um, many times. So here I am doing it. He said, your life will be one of intense activity and meditation. <laughs> so it's been active all right. But it's been a glorious life too. Mm -hmm. what, what did they say that Master died from? Did they say he, I think it was a heart attack, but... Uh, um, he just left. Left. He just left. He just left. I was there that evening. Yeah. And uh, he read this thing in the... My, this body is hallowed. I, I am hallowed. My body touched that solid. Can you fell over? Yeah. And I was with Dick Hames that night, and he said, Master has fainted. I had been writing down the words, so I hadn't been looking at him. And he, when he said, Master has fainted, I said, You wouldn't faint. You wouldn't faint. This is it. So. So were you expecting moment. it? Did you, did you have a sense? I knew he would leave his body soon, but I thought he would come back to India and then meet it here. But uh, I didn't know. Swamiji, when you, when you say that 
everybody has to free six other souls, what does that mean? Everybody has to free six other souls. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't mean they have, you have to give them liberation, but at least they have to be strong on the path. I asked that very question of uh, Master talked about one saint who was, he said to me that the, those who were liberated, completely liberated, were only the disciples of Rama, of uh, um, Lady Manger, um, Pranabhananda, and, uh, and uh, Ram Gopal Mujumdar. And I asked him about, um, uh, oh, my brain isn't working. The disciple he met in Rishikesh? Swami No. That was long before Shivananda. Kabalananda? No. no. Okay, but something on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the Anandas. Huh? <laughs> One of the Anandas. Yeah. So, did Master go to Rishikesh? Someone told huh? me he never went to Rishikesh. What? Master went to Rishikesh. That's another question. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if he did or not. And then he did all, so, also ask about his father, and there were a whole series. Yes. Right. And he, he said no to all of them. I asked about Ananda Moimano, Jivan Mukta. What about your father? No, he was too attached to us as his sons and uh, different ones, but all, no, only Pramananda and Ram Gopal. And uh, then he said, but there was other one other one that I didn't mention, and that was uh, a disciple of Ramana Maharshi, uh, Sri Rama Yogi. In Paul Brunton's book, he's called uh, Sri Yogi Ramaya. Paul Brunton met him. And uh, I asked about, what, what about Ramana Maharshi? He said, no, he's still Jivan Mukta. But his disciple is fully liberated. And uh, so I got to spend four days with Sri Rama Yogi. That was a very wonderful time. Could you talk a little bit about um, your experiences with Ananda Mahima? You, you know, those are precious things. I don't really like to talk about them. They're very hum, very precious. Mm -hmm. And your voice, the tone of your voice is so nice and calm and inviting, which I really love it. I think everybody loves it. Will you Did I hear her right? Were you talking the same way? To the master, because he was. I didn't hear the last part. Were you talking the same way to the master? Was he talking? Was your voice the same? Was his voice the same? Was your voice the same? Was your voice the same when you would talk with master? I always had well placed. You know, when I was eighteen, I studied voice, and my teacher, in fact, told me she was an old woman, and she said, "I'm only living for one thing, and that's to see you become a great singer." I just left. I was not interested in being a singer. But she had taught me to place my voice well. And I felt badly for her, but really I didn't want to sing other people's songs. I and I want the truth. Oh chasati di piagarmi, oh lasciate mi poor mori. Oh stop bugging me and let me die is basically what it's saying. <laughs> what's the use of what's the use of songs like that? But then I was at Yosemite Park, and I'd been thrown out of SRF, and I wanted to find some way to serve Master that would not conflict with them, because I didn't want to conflict with my guru's organization. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to find ways that, and uh, they, hadn't, they didn't write music, so I was at Yosemite, and somebody, uh, two boys were sitting on a bridge singing, and I was in the mood to sing, so I asked them, well, would you like me to sing? Sure, they loved it, so I sang Swing Low Sweet Chair. It's the only thing I could think of that has sort of a spiritual meaning and not much, but the only song I could think of that would go with them. I couldn't sing an Indian bhajan or um, classical music or anything like that. And uh, they were all excited and they wanted me to sing for a party they were having. And they were all excited. And I was driving home and I thought, well, 
that's something I could do. But how, what is there to sing? I've been working on the rail, you know. <laughs> I'd be ridiculous. And then I thought, well, maybe I could write my own. And the moment I thought that, this song came into my mind, and I stopped at a milkshake stand and wrote it down on a, on a paper napkin, and my brother left his guitar at my parents' house and let me use it, so um, I was off to writing some music and songs. I've done over 400, about 420 instrumental and mu uh, vocal pieces. So, anyway, all those are interesting things. Yes? What do you have to say, uh, what advice do you have to offer on the quality of faith? What advice do you have to offer on the quality of faith? Faith is not belief. Faith comes from experience. You have a hypothesis. After you've tested the hypothesis, then you can say you have faith. <clears throat> but you, science, every 10 years or so, completely changes its mind on basic things. Even Darwin, who was considered the cornerstone of modern science, now that people are questioning him. But there's one thing that's very interesting. Those who have sought God and found him, they've all said the same thing in every country, in every culture, in every age. It's always been the same truth. And so we can have faith in that. Whereas if you do a scientific hypothesis, <clears throat> it worked for Darwin, <clears throat> but it's not working now. So really faith is based on experience, but the right kind of experience is the spiritual experience. And that it's okay to believe. If you didn't believe, you wouldn't need to go yet anywhere. But you can't say I have faith until I've tested it. You can't say I have faith in this person until it's his Behavior has been tested, and you know he's true blue. So that, that's what it means. So we have to go back to America. We've been here three weeks, and uh, how do we share this experience when we get home? And do we have a responsibility to share this experience when we get home? He said, now that he's been on pilgrimage for three weeks, when he gets home, how could he? How do we share the experience we've had, and is, is there a responsibility to do so? It is your responsibility. But you know, if you talk to the wrong people, they just laugh at you. So, really speaking, it would be a good thing, if you don't live at Ananda, to try to start a community, not a community necessarily, but a center. And you could even give talks. I think you'd be capable of that. And. Uh, give talks and invite people to come. I, I do. Yeah. You okay, you can laugh, but <laughs> I tell you, you know what Master did with me? I had been with him less than, uh, I, I'd been with him eight months. I was still 22 years old. And I knew who was going to be speaking in which church because I was the one who sent out the announcements. And I knew that in San Diego, he had not spoken for two months. And I knew that this Sunday when he was announced to speak, the church would be packed. And Saturday morning, the word came down that he wanted me to go in his place. And uh, 22, and I'd never lectured in public before. So anyway, I did survive. And I think you could survive. <laughs> It's a little late, so yes? Yeah, I have a picture here. I heard this <coughs> was the last picture taken of the master. That was and taken. you are on it. It was when Vinaya Shen, the ambassador from India, came to Mount Washington, and I gave him some sweets. Okay. And he shared those sweets with him. So I was just giving him that, that package of sweets. Okay. So just two days, three days before he died. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.